Is there a lead in before we talk? Good afternoon and thank you. Today is Sunday, December 6th. I'm Denise Simmons, City Councilor, former mayor, and joining me today is my co-host, the Vice Chair of the School Committee, Monika Bowman. We're so pleased to be with you. It's been a long time. We've had a brief hiatus, but we're glad to be back on uh, this December 6th. This is our 13th show, and this is a lucky number as far as I'm concerned. You know, we have, are in the midst of a pandemic. We're very stressed out. We're working hard and trying to keep our lives, our families together and healthy. And so it was really important to, to, to Monique and I that we had this program that we really got it going again because there's so many important topics. Today, I am very excited, very excited that we're having our youth roundtable with Becoming a Man, BAM, which is a program that is national, nationwide, very, very uh, strong here in Boston and in Cambridge. And we have three of our scholar learners with Mr. Muhammad joining us to talk about, basically to, for you to hear their voices. It is so important. We, in the comings and goings, the things that we do on an everyday level, we often forget to make sure that we are listening to our young people. So I am so excited to have them with us today as uh, as I always say in all of our programs in the words of uh, John Lewis, while we all get into some good trouble. And not trouble talking about hard times, but good trouble by talking about those hard issues, those important issues that are facing us each day but that we don't always give voice to. So I am just so pleased to be here. Uh, I'm gonna apologize in advance. Uh, today is one of those days there are a lot to do. And so I'm gonna be leaving about halfway through the program, but I'm leaving you in competent and capable hands through my colleague and co-host, Ms. Monika Bowman, which I'm gonna turn it over to. But I wanna say thank you, particularly to CCTV. I gotta give a shout out to Sean that I hear is gonna be leaving us and we've got Susan leaving us. But we're gonna still be here with Marissa Grooms and all of you as we keep taking up those hard and important topics. Monika, over to you. Thank you, Denise. Yes, um, I'm really excited about our conversation today and I'm really grateful to the leadership at BAM um, that agreed to be a part of this with us. Um, you know, we're living in some really complex challenging times and I know that a lot of the conversation that we've had up until this point has really been focusing more so with adults right and I think it's really good to take a step back and hear what our young people has to say about the things and the times that we're living through um, in the context of COVID you know the before the program started you know I was you know I was somewhat joking and said, you know, this is my first pandemic again, you know, so I'm learning through it and we're all learning through it. And that is the reality of, um, for, for all of us right now. I'm particularly excited to have this conversation because our school district is starting the process, the initial process of figuring out, or starting to have conversations rather with young people um, and, and our community and families about returning back to school. Now, the irony of that is we're having a surge right now and we're seeing some of the highest COVID numbers that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And so what that tells me is we have to actually do two things at one time. We have to be able to manage the current crises that's happening and at the same time plan for the long term implications of COVID being with us, um, unfortunately, for the foreseeable future. So we're going to get to it, have some good conversation, engage our young people and um, try to figure out some of the good things that keeps us going in the middle of all of this chaos. So, you know, we're going to get started by handing it to Mr. Mohammed. Mr. Mohammed, can you just give us a little background about BAM and introduce yourself and the scholars to us? Yes, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mr. Mohammed. I am the BAM counselor at Cambridge Ridge Land High School. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us today in this round table focused on youth voice, youth perspective, our next generation, and it's my pleasure to be here with our young scholars. Uh, I wanted to, uh, what BAM is, everybody knows what BAM is, but I wanted to uh, introduce what BAM is, all the program does for our young people in the city of Cambridge and in greater Boston area. 
uh, youth guidance, uh, Becoming a Man is a school-based group counseling and social emotional learning program for young men in grades seven to 12. Uh, BAM is a fun, safe, respectful, and challenging environment to learn and grow as individuals and as a group. Uh, BAM started in Chicago in 2001, where it served in over 100 schools. Uh, in 2006, uh, University of Chicago Crime Lab randomized control trial found that scholars enrolled in the BAM program are 50% le less likely to be arrested for crimes, 25% more engaged in school, 19% more likely to graduate high school on time, and up to $30 in societal gains for every $1 invested in BAM. BAM Boston was the first expansion of uh, the first expansion city of BAM program in 2017. Uh, we serve 11 schools in the greater Boston area, including Cambridge Region Line High School. And currently, uh, BAM is expanding uh, in Seattle, LA, and London. Uh, in, BAM, uh, in, in BAM, we use a curriculum that combines a dynamic approach to youth engagement, clinical process, theory, and men's rights of passage. Uh, BAM is a training program in six core values, uh, universal values, integrity, self-determination, positive anger expression, accountability, respect for womanhood, and visionary goal setting. Uh, BAM is an opportunity for all young men uh, to learn new skills, that will help them succeed inside and outside of the classroom. Uh, and in the midst of this uh, COVID and pandemic, uh, how has BAM continued to outreach in our young people? Uh, with, so what we've learned to is Zoom. And so what I've been doing is uh, holding uh, check-ins and group for young people to be, continue to be engaged, but continue to get the support that we need in this uh, in this pandem pandemic that we're all adjusting to. Uh, and thank you, uh, I I thank you so much for having us today, uh, for having BAM in this round table that focused on young youth voice and perspective. And I'm, I'm fortunate and honored to be with me, with me have three BAM scholars to represent CRLS. These young men are committed, driven, hardworking, and today I'm with Ishraq, Noah, and Kasim. And I'll have the scholars introduce themselves and just this is a round table for our young kings and with their perspective. Uh, I'm Ishtarok. I'm a sophomore at CRLS, and this is my second year at BAM. My name is Noah. Um, I'm a sophomore, and I this is my second year in BAM. My name is Kasim. I'm a sophomore, and I'm a second year BAM scholar at CRLS. Wonderful. Well, you know, it's 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 really clear that we're very fortunate um, in the city of Cambridge and particularly our Cambridge Public Schools that have the BAM program here. So let's get right into the conversation. You know, BAM scholars, I, I want you to give me some insights on how the BAM program has impacted you particularly and how has this um, program BAM impacted your views on school and education and your future. So let's start off with um, Kasim. Thank you. Um, BAM has been really, really a long road for me. It's been a roller coaster, really, because um, it's the program has been packed to me in so many different ways, you know. Um, beforehand, I didn't really want to go to BAM because beforehand, it just didn't feel right for me. I felt like in many ways, I could have helped myself out. I could have helped, maybe my family would have helped me out. But then Mr. Muhammad gave me more opportunities in life and, I, and he knocked on my door and I had to answer it because without, without opportunities, it's gonna make you feel more overwhelmed, more stressed and et cetera, et cetera. Um, he just gave me an outlet that made me feel more powerful and more impactful. And when we would go, and have check-ins, he would always say, whatever you say in this circle stays in this circle. Whatever you do, all your emotions stay in this circle. Whatever you go through will stay in this circle. Nobody will go out of the circle in it and, and tell you, tell any, everybody around you, everybody at the school what you feel. And that just made me feel powerful, made me feel more, more of, a, of, a, of a better student because he's giving us a chance to really, you know, think about, oh, okay, you can really do this at the same time. Just be patient, 
um, reach the reach to the highest, keep your head up, and do what you need to do. And he just gave me a big outlet. And since COVID happened, we can we didn't do as much as we wanted to because our lifestyle has changed really differently. Um, and when we would have check-ins, he would just tell us, oh, is everything okay? Do you need any support? Do you need anything in general? And he just, it's just so impactful to me that I had somebody to look up to and to have somebody to hold on to and and all that. But, oh no, oh no. Yo, that sucks. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we can still see you. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> and yeah, you're good. <laughs> But Mr. Kasim, you made a, a, an interesting point, and you said at first I didn't want to do it; it didn't feel right. Uh, and I'm just interested about you know the program has so much capacity. Have you either of you? I'm focusing in on Mr. Kasim, but have either of you sort of compared your experience now to some of your um, other friends, kids, you know, young men that you know, do you see a difference? That's number one. And one of the things that you said, Mr. Muhammad, right at the beginning, you said are young kings. I think it'd be important uh, that you explain either the young men, the young kings themselves, why you say young kings, because I think it's really important, but I'm really interested in it didn't feel right. And so when you look at other people, Mr. Kasim or Ishraq or Noah, do you, when you compare you being in this program and that empowering feelings you have now and those that don't, do you, do you see a contrast? Do you see a difference? What is that like? Um, I, I somewhat see a difference. I see myself taking on more opportunities, sometimes being more productive than some of my peers. And BAM helps me with that. Kind of gives me a leg up on like, you know, what I'm trying to achieve. You're muted, Monica. You're muted. I'm mute. Sorry. Um, I think that's going to be like the word for 2020. You're muted. <laughs> I'm mute. But what's been interesting for me, um, you know, this whole sense of having to, um, we have to motivate ourselves in ways that we never had before, whether you're an adult or a child. And so, you know, Noah, can you just talk a little bit more about the program and how has it impacted you and what does that motivation feels like and look like from, from your vantage point? You're asking me, right? Yes, yes. Come on, Noah, give it to us. <laughs> so, like, and during, when right when the pandemic hit, I wasn't really sure how we would, how school would work. So I just... I kind of like shut down, kind of. I just stopped doing work. And Mr. Muhammad uh, would reach out and be like, hey, do you need anything? How can I support you? And that kind of inspired me to try actually like working on my stuff. And yeah. Uh, I want to add that BAM has allowed me to be connected to this boy when I was younger. Uh, so I, I, my family migrated here when I was uh, eight, eight and a half, nine, uh, from Kenya, Somalia. We ran from civil war to get an opportunity to be here. So now seeing these young men is a, like a mirror, it's like a mirror. And I'm connected to that boy and the resources and the support and the mentors I've had in my life that allow me to be in the place that I am today. So now it's not about what, what, the, what I'm doing for the young men, but it's what am I not doing? And what is my job to continue to put them in a place for them to be successful? And that's what all of BAM is about, is an opportunity. And it's volunteering for a reason. Because we're trying to empower our young people to understand the power within that. We have to help them see that. We have to guide them. And so when I'm connected to our, my young boy and the struggle that I went through, the challenges that I went through, everybody goes through all of that. So now what am I going to do as a counselor, as a clinician, to be in place to use a strength-based approach to support our young people, especially right now with COVID? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because 
particularly, you know, I, I'm an African American woman. I grew up in um, the South um, in a deeply segregated place. And um, being able to stay focused in the midst of adversity is just built into my DNA in a way that I think gave me insights on how to prepare for this moment. That said, nothing can prepare us for the trauma, um, quite frankly, that we're all experiencing right now. So I'm you know, really curious, um, how, how has COVID impacted your learning and how you approach school and education? Um, let's start with Noah. Noah, can you give us some insights? Like what has your experience been and how has COVID impact your learning? Um, COVID has impacted my learning. It's like, I've never had to do the whole online schooling thing. So it was like, oh, it was a, a, like a, a big jump in how I was learning. And I wasn't exactly, uh, I'm not quick on my feet. I can't, I can't adapt that fast to something that's entirely new. And it really was a, it was iffy because I, last year, like my grades like took a sudden dive right when COVID hit and I was just trying to keep up in it. I've done way better than like entering this year, but it was really bad. So Noah, what were some of the things, like you said it was a, a, a challenge last term, but you've been able to do better this term. What were some of the things that helped you to, to kind of pivot? Um, just finding the motivation, finding like a good time to get my work done. It was, it was bad before. So just looking back and seeing I really didn't do that good was kind of the inspiration I needed to actually do my work. Mm. Yeah, can, I follow, can I follow up a little bit, uh, Manika, to Mr. Noah? Uh, did you find the program, like a set of guardrails, like when you felt like you were veering off one way or another, the, the BAM program provided you guardrails so you wouldn't like go off the road. Is that the kind of support you feel that you got? Because that's what it sounds like. Is it, would you say that that was what it, the program does? I would definitely say that the, as you said, the program was a guardrail. It stopped me from veering too far over the side. It's great. Isharak, can you just give us your experience? Tell us how COVID has impacted you and your learning. Well, um, like Noah said, it was a struggle at first, definitely like the first, at first when we had online learning, it was hard to stay motivated. Like last year, late last year, it was hard to stay motivated. It was hard to get work done and it was easy to slip, but now kind of like strength, I've gotten better at it. Like I've adjusted, I've, uh, I'm doing really well in my classes now compared to what I was doing at the end of last year. Kasim, give us your thoughts. Um, COVID has impacted me because before, um, because COVID and online learning is different from really being in school because, um, before I was in school, I was participating more than I am now because, but now since we're going through this pandemic and doing social, um, um, doing online learning, before like, before all that, like when it was starting to happen, I didn't care about online learning at all. Like I would literally get up around two o'clock in the morning, no, two o'clock in the afternoon um, and like just, not care about it at all, like not doing homework, not doing anything at all. But when Mr. Muhammad came to play and everybody around me was like, hey, you got to really do this work. Do you really want to pass or do you really want to do this class again? So I'm like, you know what? I don't want to really want to do this class again because I'm going to try and succeed in life. The more better I get at my education, the better life will be for me. So I made planners for myself. I made plans for myself. I made different agendas i i um i made a remote plan and i still do this to this day um i keep a plan with me so if i have this stuff to work on i will do it 
and then I have this work for this day, I will do it. I make time for myself. I, I do breaks here and there. And it just makes me feel more organized and more confident in myself. So I don't got to do it in the long run. So yes, I feel, I feel like it impacted me in a different way. And it just made me feel like more of like more powerful and more confident in myself because now I have more time to do my work than how I was doing my work and when I was in school. So now it's going to make me feel more, more um, engaged in class and I can just, I don't have to go downstairs just so I can do work. I could just stay in my room and just relax and do work at the same time. So it's like, it makes me feel more comfortable in myself. So yeah, it definitely impacts me in a bigger way. Uh, in BAM, oh, our core values, uh, self-determination, vision and goal setting, uh, and positive anger expression, uh, I've learned from the start of COVID to now that has been essential for our scholars, not that other level of core values or not, in determining and supporting them that are providing that hope, that universality, and that elderly these young men are going through this together. And what was and what is my job to provide this uh, in our groups to provide a safe space for them to come in that is challenging emotionally, but supporting them being connected to that emotion, how they're feeling. So our young men that were conditioned to feel happy or angry. So now what is our, uh, what is my job to reframe that and tell young boys that it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling, whatever that, whatever that is. And to provide a space for our young people to not judge each other, but to support one another. No, you know, I, what I'm hearing uh, what in this conversation, you know, for me as an adult having to manage all of this, um, even for myself being aware that when my behavior starts to shift, it's probably because there's this emotion that's inside of me that I have not given myself permission to be able to express, right? And, and what I hear is BAM gives young people the opportunity to be able to tap into those inner feelings in a way that then allow them to be successful moving forward. Um, you know, the one thing I really appreciate about this program and what's inspiring me from our young people is, yes, this is really, really, really hard right now. COVID is just devastating in so many ways and it's not gonna last forever. And so when this is done, there's a place in the world and in society for our young people and the way in which they manage this moment will allow them to be able to move forward after COVID is done. So I really just appreciate BAM for being able to, to, to guide our young people in that direction. One of my favorite sayings is when you're on the edge of a cliff, progress is not measured by taking a step forward. Sometimes you just need to take a step back. And so I see that the work that BAM is doing is allowing our young people to take a step back so they can effectively move forward. Um, I know Denise has to head out, but I, I think that she has a, a question that she wants to pose to the young people before she go. Yeah, actually a couple of questions that they may have to drag me out of here. Um, <laughs> first of all, I want to just say, I am very inspired. You know, we as adults, we put on a, I call it the game face, mm -hmm. so that we make sure that everybody else feels good and can move forward. But we do worry and we are concerned. And one of the things that this moment has done for me personally is you three gentlemen have given me some inspiration uh, to kind of keep pushing forward. So thank you for that and, and continue to do that. One of the things we always talk about and, and, and Ms. Monika mentioned it about, we're not gonna always have this pandemic. We can only hope. What is the what is the new normal? I never say normal anymore. I said, what does the new normal look like for you gentlemen? What are your expectations? That's question one. And the second question, and if it's too hard or difficult to answer, I can understand is now that you've been through it and been in it, if you were to have the floor of the city council or the school committee or the stairs of city hall, what would you say, this is what we would like you to do. This is what we would like to see that is different. Does anyone feel comfortable sharing this? And after you gentlemen share, I'd love to hear from you too, Mr. Muhammad. So what's the new normal look like? 
And what would you, what would you do if it was your job to make a change? What would you change? What would you recommend? Ishraq, you're you're my eyesight, so I'm gonna start with you. What would you what would you say? You know, this is what I would recommend that we do a little bit differently. Is it providing? Go ahead. I'm not really sure, actually. Okay, it's fair. Like it, yeah. It's hard to kind of come up with that. Does do Mr. Kazim or Mr. Noah, if you had to make recommendations about how we go forward, would you do you have any ideas what that might look like? In some ways, I think you've already said about it. Uh, we talked about having guardrails. You know, we have in our school system, unfortunately, we have a big gap in terms of performance between black males in particular and everyone else. And I'm wondering if we put guardrails for all our black male scholars, would they do better? Mr. Muhammad, do you want to weigh in a little bit? Yes. Uh, what I what I've heard from the young kings is that earlier is that the adjustment period. So when this happened out of nowhere, and they didn't even know what to do, they didn't even know how to adjust because nothing this has never happened before. So now, as educators, as a, somebody, how, what are, what can we do? Because the the process is that the hope is to go back. The hope is to go back in, in person. And keep in mind that we've done this for a year, almost a year, and they were scholars are still adjusting, but they've adjusted to the online learning. So now mm -hmm. our job, what are, what are going to be our job to make sure we put resources in place? We are communicating with our parents, with their parents, making sure that we put our scholars in place and resources in place. So when they go back, they're adjusting smoothly. We can't control how, but we can control what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I, I'm an educator, as a clinician, I'm providing the services online. But what is my job to bring that back into that group session to make sure that that continues, right? So now as a, a teachers, so now we make everything online. So now what would it look like for us to come back and, and put places mm -hmm. in place for young people to succeed? Because with their, these young kings and the young people I work with, they're just more, more determined than we can possibly think about. Mm -hmm. okay? and the self-determination is, so what is our job to make sure that we put our, our resource in place for our young people? What does that, that look like? My, my judgment is it's hard for them because they don't know, but we know. So based on what they're saying to us in the conversations that we're having, how we our community, our families, because the most important that youth engagement and that parent engagement. Because who we're supporting is not just the scholar, but their parents. So now as a community, what are we doing to make sure we do that? So now we plan that slowly. Thank you. That, thank you for sharing that. That's that's important for us to hear because I, I certainly agree. How is it that we have these gentlemen, these kings, and, and no one has told me what why you use the word kings. I'd love to know that. But um it's, it's important for us as leaders to know what works and apply that. And if these young kings are progressing, if they're doing well, then it behooves us, I believe, um, as the leadership to find ways to replicate that and support. Because I am very happy that these young men and, and all the young kings that participate in the program are doing so well. And how do we reach back? to get those that are not doing so well. And you've given us some ideas, the parent involvement, the guardrails, the encouragement. The, it sounds like the expectation uh, as well. Um, and one of the things that I didn't hear you say, but I think of when you talk is about giving these young men dignity and self-respect that they can, it's not like a awkward, act of protest, but it's a resistance to failing. Mm. And, and I think that it's just so extraordinary and so important that there's this resistance to failing because you're right, Mr. Muhammad, and I hope Noah and Mr. Kasim and Mr. Israq feel this way, is that failure is not an option and that there's so much untapped potential. 
Yeah, Denise, I think that what you said is really powerful. I, I, I often speak, particularly a lot at the school committee level, about my educational experience um, where I grew up. Um, most of my educators were Black um, or people of color. And um, I, I, you know, I grew up in very, very humble circumstances. And my educators, regardless of what my socioeconomic status was, it really wasn't discussed, you know? Yeah what was discussed was you need to achieve. I see something in you, you are dynamic, you are brilliant. And so that is what I leaned into. And so the fact that I grew up in public housing didn't matter <laughs> because yeah. the people around me made me feel as I was just as important as the, the teacher who's, whose child was you know, in our school too, like we were equal. And so that is the programming and that is what we need to see take place um, in our school district. You know, I'm really curious from our scholars, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the remote, remote learning, right? I want to dig a little bit more into that because I know moving forward, COVID has disrupted school. Like school the way you, you knew it in the past is officially over. <laughs> and most people don't do well with change, even adults, right? We just, we don't do well with it. But the reality is, is this COVID has shifted the way in which we um, administer our educational systems and platforms. I'm just curious, what about remote learning is good? And what is, a, what is it about remote learning that you think, oh, absolutely not. We just need to walk away from it altogether. So I want to start off with Noah. What, tell me, what's, what's good about it? And what are the things that you just absolutely don't like about it? Um, the good things about remote learning is like the, that the um, guidelines are kind of, they're there, but they're not, you can't really enforce them in the same way as you did before uh, remote learning started. And the one, one of the things I don't like about remote learning is that like on Zoom, you'll have breakout rooms and they'll be like, hey, oh, uh, go into the breakout rooms and talk to some of your peers about like, let's say a math problem. And then you'll be sitting in the breakout room and then you just won't talk to anyone. It's not the, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the, the connection isn't there when it comes to uh, your peers, Oh, yeah. Interpersonal. The interpersonal relationship is not there because of COVID, right? Yes. Um, and that, that brings me to why our young, uh, young scholars are uh, called, well, we, we call them scholars and cakes, right? That the failure is not an option. And that kingdom, that they're kings in their own future and their own that. So we call them kings because they can dictate their future. Right, we can just be there to guide them. So now, what are we doing to make sure that, like, based on the environment we live in, the person environment, the community they live in, the young men they are right now, the young men they want to become, what are, what am I doing to make sure that, like, I'm I'm supporting them, but I'm, I'm reminding them that this kingdom, the king you are, the scholar you are, like, the like your potential is beyond, it's beyond. And what is my job to help them see that? Students, they are students, they are youth. But language matters. And how are we using that to make sure that we're empowering a young man and using that? When, we, when you said failure is not an option with our educators. So now how can we put our, our scholars, one thing I wanted to add and I, how can we put our scholars on the table for them to voice how they want to go back to? Because it's all about us making decisions for them. And yes, sometimes we have to do that. But what would it look like for our young people to have a voice in those tables, round tables, for them to be advocated, advocacy? So we teach them what advocacy is, advocating for themselves. So now you're not just hearing it from you and what we learned to see what COVID is, but you're learning from our young people all around. And what is that for them? Not just for these young kings here, for, every, for our young people. So now when we're going back and doing this, we're making a decision based on how we feel, how we how we do things, but also we have words there to support our young people, to put them in a place for them to be successful. And how can we do that if we don't put our young people on the table for them to voice their 
powerful, powerful words in, in, in voice. So I wanted to add that. That's what that meant. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I consider this roundtable is an extension of, you know, giving our young people the platform to be able to, you know, give their thoughts on what's happening with them. You know, you have myself and you have Denise, who is, you know, the former mayor of the city and a city councilor. And, you know, we're we're in it up to our elbows <laughs> as it relates to all of these conversations and having the opportunity to speak to our young people helps us to be able to reimagine and think differently and hear all those different perspectives. You know, I also want to encourage our young people to continue to pay attention to what's happening at our school committee meetings and our city council meetings. You know, sometimes, you know, they're not the most exciting things, and sometimes they are, they can get really interesting sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, those are the places and the platforms by which people um, are decision makers, you know, that's the, have the space and the conversation to be able to move forward important decision making. And when I think about this conversation of, you know, remote learning, um, Kasim, I, I think about what something that you said earlier, when you said that you were able to organize yourself um, and get a schedule together. So I'm just curious from your perspective, do you want to see a, at least a portion of remote learning stay once we come back and go back into schools? Or do you think that we need fully um, in person? I get Noah, you're absolutely right. The internet makes us able to, to connect with a lot of people at the same time, but it's very interpersonal. Um, um, is, is not personal, excuse me. And there's like this intimacy that's lost whenever we have conversations in this way. So Kasim, what do you think? Do you think we should hold on to a little bit of remote? Should it all be in person? What do you think will move our educational system forward? I feel like, I feel like before, I feel like should, the cases should probably, and um, once the cases go down a little bit, then we can start to really focus on like the the whole going back to school part because at this point like you said it's like we having like a whole crisis right now at the we having a surge that there's a lot of cases in Massachusetts right now and I feel like since that's happening I feel like at this point remote learning is only the best way that we can pro we can get our education from at, at this time point because like I said before then like before all this our lifestyle has changed really different since the pandemic happened and yes, we made time for ourselves with remote learning and we can do things that we need to do instead of being at an actual school and doing this at a certain time and then going to our next class and then doing this at a certain time. But when we do remote learning, it's like we balance our time even more often than what we would do at school. So yeah, um, I feel like remote learning is our best decision at this point even though a lot of people feel like they should go back to school. And a lot, I've seen a few people that I know are going back to school and they are kind of risking their lives getting their education. So, and I respect that. And, and I, and I pray for them because, you know, it's hard being in a school and during the, during COVID and really thinking about, Oh, are they really going to have cases at this school? And I'm at this school and we having a lot of cases in Massachusetts. So me being protective of myself, because I tested negative um, for COVID, by the way. And I, and when that happened, I felt like, you know what? I feel like it's best for me to stay home. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stay home because it's more of a better decision for me. And it makes me feel more, it makes me feel, pay more attention to work and it making me have balancing out my my learning and balancing out my my family and my and my social life and self determination is one of my best my my best ways to describe it because with, uh, without self determination and visual goal setting you can't really get goal you can't really make goals for yourself so it's definitely one of my favorite things to have is visionary goal setting and self determination and I push myself to the limit and do what I need to do. And I make plans for myself, like I said. And I, I just and I just do it. I do it for the greater good. And and yeah, that's really it. Hey, 
I was going to say to follow up on that a little bit. So are you saying if we, when we can go back, there's nothing that you'd want to hold on to uh, with the remote learning or you're, or are you saying, well, I could, we could do a little bit of it. What, what are you thinking? Can you sharpen that answer for me a little bit? Basically what I'm trying to say is that I feel like it's best for us to be at remote learning. I feel like it's best for us to be at remote learning because it's a less chance of us risking our lives to go back to school and having our, having COVID. Yeah. And okay. I'm not saying that we should have the few days of being at remote learning and then a few days being at school. I'm not saying that. I'm okay. saying that I feel like I'm doing my differences between remote learning and being at school. Okay. And my, so to save time, I feel like visionary goal setting and self-determination for me is the best way to, to get past those obstacles and to have better, um, better, what's the word for it? better you know outcomes yeah <laughs> yeah that's, that's the what i come up with but it's better to have a better outcome of it and remote learning has been kind of more of an outlet for me even though a lot of people hate it but at the end of the day it's like we have to do it but um if you want to get your education you're gonna have to do remote learning yeah you, you can go to school if you want to but that's gonna risk your life but Whatever is best for them is best for them. I'm not going to judge them on how they are. Whatever they feel like they want to do that makes them feel proud about themselves and that can make them have their own education, that's what they want to do. I'm not going to force them to do anything. But at the end of the day, remote learning is the best decision for us, and that's the way that we can get our education in a bigger way. Yeah, I really think what you said is really key because one thing that we've tried to do in the school district is create choice for our families. Um, and as much as possible, even for our educators, which is a bit more complicated, um, um, but as it relates to choice for our families. And what I wanna encourage people to do, if you go on our website, um, our CPSD website, it gives you, there's a, a dashboard there that gives you all the information regarding the number of cases that we've had as it relates to our school district, um, what classes has been impacted by COVID for the in-person um, learning program. And so, um, you know, we've been in school now for a while. And yes, we've had ca some cases, but I want to really clarify for people that a lot of our cases did not, there was an in-school transmission at a high rate. So I'm not saying that there was not in-school transmission, but it is very low. And our school district has invested $17 million into mitigation efforts um, to ensure that our schools are as safe as possible because unfortunately we're going to be here a very long time and families, um, they're gonna have to make choices as it relates to how to move forward. So Kasim, I really appreciate your passion. Like, yes, for you, you wanna stay at your house <laughs> and learn and make sure that our school district provide you with everything you need to do that. So I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> and I also know that there are families that, that recognize that the, the, the other risk as it relates to the social emotional health of their young people is, is just, it's, it's struggling right now. And we're getting a push to figure out how to bring um, some scholars, not all, um, of course, back to school in a way that is safe. And so I just want to let, you know, our scholars know, as well as the public know that you, Cambridge is really unique. And before Denise have to jump off, you know, maybe she could speak a little bit more about this on this on this city council side. We actually have the resources needed to figure out what are the best strategies to put in place to ensure that our scholars and our educators are as safe as possible as we manage through this really uncharted territory. So, you know, I know Denise's um, um, chair over the budget and finance committee on the city council right. side, and maybe she can right. speak a little bit more to, um, you know, how the city council is thinking about supporting our school district to meet the, this both and need that we have. Yeah, thank you, Monique. And it kind of leads to a couple of questions that we have, you know, so as the city council just recently, in fact, added $9 million to the city count to the school department budget. And we did that in, in part because we wanted to make sure that the quality of learning, whatever that was, would continue. One of the things that we also have realized that some students didn't have equal access to 
the internet. And it's important for us to know that, particularly the school committee, but also the city council, because the city council funds the school committee. So the city council has sat down with the school committee on, on at least two occasions to try to figure this out. How do we make sure that our, our, our students are getting the support and the resources that they need to be successful? So uh, as city council, I cannot make rules or the city council cannot make rules for the school department, but we can fund initiatives or the needs of the school department. So it's always important for us to know what's going on, not only from parents, because we do hear from parents, and that's what's so good about hearing your voices is what do you need? And so. Yeah, Denise, you meant mute on us. <laughs> not to uh, make you, the scholars, the ambassadors uh, for all students, but just from your, your corner of the world, have you found remote learning difficult uh, in terms of access? And are any of you kind of getting tired of it? Because that's just, you know, that's important for us to know because we're always trying to find ways to fund, ways to keep you engaged. So I would say, are you having problems or do you know of other students that are having problem around internet access? Um, is is being at home. So I hear Mr. Cassini, you're saying, I want to be home because it keeps me safe. And it's all about going forward, but I want to be safe. I guess what I'm also under want to know in terms of what the city can do is for making sure you have the tools to one, be safe, but also to learn adequately. So either yourselves or your peer group, and, and Mr. Muhammad, you can weigh in on this. I'm very interested in knowing, do you have sufficient bandwidth in terms of technology to do your studies? I guess, and the other question is like, are you weary of it? Because I do have, I have a, a teenager, a granddaughter that's in school and she says, I just want to see people. It kind of talks to what you said, Mr. Kasim. I want to see people too, but not so much that I don't want to put myself in harm's way. So um, are you tired of it? Do you have the adequate tools to do your work? And then I'm going to say a few more words and then I am going to take my leave from you. But uh, I want to hear your answers first. Uh, I'd say I have pretty adequate tools for it. Sometimes my Wi-Fi might cut out. I might get kicked from a Zoom call just from that. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty good, though. I think maybe a solution for people with inadequate Wi-Fi or whatever is if we could some in some way make a library of sorts not exactly like a library like open up uh cambridge public libraries but some sort of place where everybody can get wi-fi like some uh some kind of like hotspot hotspot right yeah for people to come in and you know get some work done for the day okay not necessarily at home, um, some place where you can get, you know, we're always trying to balance between getting people together in person and not. So we'd want to do it in such a way that you were going to be safe if you went someplace to get that information. But one of the ideas you said, you know, making sure other students that may not have such good or adequate learning spaces have some adequate learning spaces that they could go to. Okay. Uh, no, Mr. Noah, Mr. Kazim, do you have uh, any feeling about that? Um, Problems with Wi-Fi? So, like, my sister uh, goes to. Okay, let me let me restart. Um, so my sister goes to uh, a school that's like really close to me, and it's like I'm pretty sure they are providing like stuff like internet or something. I don't I don't know exactly what it is, but it would like it would I'm pretty sure it would give you internet. And I think we should uh provide more stuff like that or just give people the ability to uh have internet if they don't already have it. Okay. All right. Mr. Kazoo yeah, follow up Yeah, so I'm sorry. So also follow up to follow up with um Noah, but um he I feel like, yeah, we should definitely provide more internet. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like um Ezra would say, um, me too. I would um my internet would cut out. But that didn't stop me. That didn't stop me from doing my work. That didn't stop me from doing what I needed to do. 
um, I'm here to work and work only. I don't. I'm not here to get distracted. I'm not here to to fool around. I'm here to. I'm here to work. And that's all that matters at the end of the day, because people are just joking around, not caring about work. But while like, people are working hard and doing what they need to do so that they can provide for their families, that's the good thing about the whole situation. So that's why I feel like we should um, we should provide more materials, more, you know, in, like Internet, like Noah said, you know, everything that they need so they can so they can pass grades so they can graduate, you know, because we want because we want the next generation to do the same thing. And then the next generation, next generation forward. So I really feel like definitely providing more of the the simple things that they need. And mm -hmm. also, if they don't have computers, we can provide them. We would make plans to provide them computers so they don't have to worry about you know right. being late right. and not worrying about oh my god I have to do this at this certain time or oh, I don't got a computer this that and the third. So that's why I feel like it's the best decision for us to provide them with those things. And they won't tell, so they don't have to worry about, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you said, but, I think it's important, if I name Manika. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is what I, particularly what I hear from Mr. Kasim is saying, I'm not going to let anything stand in my way mm -hmm. in getting what I need to have done. Because I know from the city council perspective, we always struggle. Do students have what they need and trying to meet their need. But what we don't hear, and I think is what's important, and I want this to resonate to anyone that could be listening and just for us to put in our toolboxes, we have students that are going to succeed because failure is not an option to them. And that's what I think is important. Fail, I'm not gonna fail. If I have to stand on the corner and lean like this <laughs> to get a signal, I'm gonna do that. You know, you shouldn't have to, but we, I think we have to meet that intensity of desire with the intensity of what we need to provide. And I, I just think that's important. So I, I'm just over the moon with what you had to say, because I think we often think about some of our scholars and some of our kids as, oh, these poor kids, they don't have, they can't do, they, they need. But what you're saying, each of you in your own way is, I'm going to get it whether you give it to me or not. I'm happy to have it. I will use it to its best ability, but I'm going to, I'm going to use it. So before, as I take my leave from you, I can't say enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've given me hope. You've given me inspiration. And, and something that comes to mind from hearing each of you talk and yourself too, Mr. Muhammad, um, and, and, and I know my sister Manika knows this, it's a, one of my favorite civil rights activists was Bayard Rustin. And he says, when an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity upon him. I thank you for conferring dignity upon us as individuals, mm -hmm. as your leaders, as, as your teachers, as your representatives. I can go back now to my venue of the city council and say, I've talked to some extraordinary men and I know that the future is hopeful and bright. And I thank each of you for being in it, doing the hard work. We stand with you, we stand beside you, we stay behind you. Thank you so very much. Yeah, and thank you, Denise, for being with us. Um, it, it's always a joy to partner and do these. So we, we have more. So to be continued, these, Denise and I, we will be back and we will continue to keep these conversations going. Um, one thing that I really appreciate about our conversation right now, and Denise is right. A lot of times we feel like we need to save people, particularly black and brown people. And I just, that drives me nutty. I don't, I don't want to be saved. I just need support. I need support and I need resources. And so for folks out there listening, if they're young scholars out there listening, I want everyone to know that our school district offers a one-to-one -one, um, computer uh, program. So if you are having issues with accessing a computer or don't have a computer, our district has one for you. <laughs> so let us know, reach out to me, and we will make sure that you have that. Um, in addition, when we talk about internet access, I know that our school district have worked really hard to make sure that we have hotspots for youth, not only just our school district, um, but also the city council as well. So if there are any scholars out there that are listening to this program and have needs that are not being met, 
please do reach out to us because we have the resources. We just need to make sure you have what you need and provide you with the support so you can be able to, to thrive. I have two more questions um, and then we're, we're gonna close out. So we're moving forward in the school district with having these conversations about planning for school reopening. And I know that's really complex when we have that conversation in the middle of a pandemic. But I have a specific question for our scholars um, at the high, that because you're at the high school. I know climate and culture and accountability is all, a, it goes into a lot as it relates to being able to make sure that other people are safe. One of the reasons why our K through third grade model has, you know, worked so much is because with little kids, I have one, I have a six year old, you can tell them do X and nine times out of 10, they're gonna do it. <laughs> when you get a little older, you have a little agency, you can push back in a different way. So I'm just curious, you know, from your experience um, with work at high school and your peers, do you think we have um, the discipline necessary to be able to bring our kids back and adhere to the rules for the public safety of others? And, and what are the things we can do to in, in motivate our young people to understand that their decisions have an impact on other people's um, ability to be able to learn if we are able to go back to in-person. So maybe Noah, can you give me um, any thoughts that you have on that? I don't think uh, if, if we as like high schoolers and teenagers don't wanna do something, I don't think it's like a thing that you could do to force us to do something. I'm not like if if I'm asked to do something, I'll do it. It's plain. I said plain and simple. But not everyone operates in the same way I do, and I think they would need like to get work done and to for those people to get work done and to do the things they're supposed to do. I feel like they need incentives. What that may like be like as incentives, I don't know. But yeah, I think that's powerful. You just have to ask. I think sometimes we just don't ask. So, and it's okay to engage a young person and just ask them to do something. And, you know, they'll rise to the occasion. I mean, even adults, you have to ask them and wait for their res their response. Um, Isarak, do you wanna, what do you think? What do you, as it relates to your peers and being able to come back in the building in the context of all of this, um, is there ways that we can hold each other accountable for the health and safety of others? Um, I don't really know, uh, at least in the coming months, probably not, but after like there's a vaccine and we get better at dealing with COVID and there's lower rates, then it will be a lot easier to do something because people will feel a lot more comfortable to follow rules that somebody gives them that will feel safer and not just try to go off the rails and do their own thing. And thank you for that. So I have one last question. We're hitting up on the hour. This has been such a great conversation, but I want each one of you to give me one minute response. I know this is just such a hard time, um, but even in the middle of hard times, there is joy. <laughs> so I want to hear one thing that has brought you joy in the middle of all of this chaos. So I'll go first. The one thing that's brought me joy, I have a nine month old baby. And every time I see her, she just makes me so happy. And she's just brought so much joy into our household. So that's my joy in the middle of all the COVID chaos. So what is your joy in the middle of all the COVID chaos? So let's go with um, the theme. What's your joy in the middle of the chaos? My favorite, my, my joy in, in, during the chaos is being able to see family, you know, because without family, you can't really do nothing during this pandemic. Um, I'm definitely, um, I'm definitely blessed to have family. I'm definitely grateful to have family. I love everybody in my family. We go through hard times. We've been through our ups and downs, but at the end of the day, we got each other, and that's all that matters. Um, my mom's my, my my mom's my ride or die. My dad's my ride or die. My sister's my ride or die. Everybody in my family's my ride or die, and I'm not going to trade anything from them or or switch sides or any of them because at the end of the day, they gave me life, and that's going to stick that way. And I'm going to teach my, my future, my future kids the same thing. So definitely um, my family is my number one priority. God first, but at the end of the day, it's my family. So it's just. It's
you're 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 cutting out on us, um, Kasim. So I'm gonna go with Noah. And Noah, can you tell me the one thing that has brought you joy in the middle of the COVID chaos? Um, I would say something like video games or something, but okay. I'm gonna take the approach of friends. My friends have been like my rock. Like I've uh during my whole period of not doing my work, the ones who inspired me mainly were like my friends. And they were the ones who like gave me the motivation and like the happiness to do what I wanted to do or needed to do for that matter. But yeah. Isarak, what is your joy in the middle of the COVID chaos? Um, I'm going to go with same thing as Noah. I think my friends, I, being able to talk to them, that's what helped push myself to keep going and also just uh, being alone or just having a lot of time to yourself, it's, like, really, I think a joy of mine was really able to, like, sit with myself, learn more about myself as a person. It's really powerful. Mr. Muhammad, what is your joy in the middle of the COVID chaos? This. This. And family. I've been able to see my uh, my dad, my family, and today just being able to sit in a round table with my young uh, scholars and being they, them. It was it was hard for me to not say something because I'm I usually say something. So now to sit back and allow our scholars to voice their opinion, the perspective has been has been amazing. And what I've taken away from this is that the agency the strength perspective. And the first thing that learning BAM, a good mission is asking for what you want and what you need. Sometimes when you ask, you get it. Sometimes you don't. But that is a soft skill that young people are learning and need to learn in order for them to continue to understand that I, I that she's my teacher. I might not have the best relationship, but she's there to support me. So I'm gonna ask her for an extension. I'm gonna ask her for support or Mr. Muhammad, or my mom. So now that is a soft skill that that I'm learning to use. I've learned to use since I've been in BAM. So enjoy. Enjoy, enjoy is family, our young people here, and for, for you guys for having us today. I absolutely loved it. Thank you for having us, and I appreciate it. Well, I'm just really so grateful um, to even be in a place of privilege to be able to have um, the opportunity to have these types of conversations. So thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, thank you for sharing your insights and your opinions. And all of this will you know, shape our decision making moving forward. And I would love to follow up and give you more insights on how to be a part of the conversation. For everyone that's watching, please know that our family resource um, team will be reaching out because we are starting the process to start a conversation around what it could look like for other grades within our school district to come back. It's gonna take a lot of work, folks. I'm not gonna lie about that. We, um, we will have a vaccine. They're in the process of being approved. However, it's gonna take a long time to um, immunize millions of people across our country and quite frankly, billions of people across the world. And so until we get to a point where COVID is eradicated, we're gonna all have to adjust our lives um, to figure out a way to educate our young people and move forward because COVID will not be with us long always, but how we manage this moment will have a significant impact on us moving forward. So please continue to be a part of the conversation. Thank you so much and stay tuned to see CCTV and you'll see different announcements of our next um, series of conversations as it relates to Black Cambridge and COVID-19. One thing that Denise and I are committed to is actually having a deep dive conversation around this vaccine. I know there's a lot of skepticism, particularly in the Black community, and I get and understand why. I know the history of this, the Tuskegee Project and the reasons why we have some questions around how this vaccine will impact our community. So we're committed to having those conversations to really get the necessary information so our community will know that the vaccine is safe. Um, and what it means for us moving forward. So thank you for tuning in today. Thank you to my panelists. Um, I look forward to continuing to engage you. Thank you, Bam. Thank you, CCTV. And 
and tune in next time. Be well. Bye-bye.